Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of High Strangeness. Uh, it's been a while. I'm glad you guys stopped in again. Um, yeah, sorry for uh, being missing in action for a while, but, you know, life calls. A lot of things have been going on lately uh, with work and all kinds of crazy stuff. So we're finally getting back around to uh, making videos again. So um, we're going to be diving in again here. Just finished uh, watching my Longhorns get beat by Alabama uh, by a point, which was really, really surprising. Uh, very disappointing that we ended up losing, but pretty happy by the way they played. Uh, we should have a great team this year. Um, not ranked, which is outrageous. Hopefully that changes after this uh, loss. We lost by like a point. I think it was like 19 to 20 is what the game was, but super close, super competitive. We almost had it, but um, yeah, so we're going to jump into another episode this time. Uh, we're going to be looking at a video um, about Mary Maria Rosenthal, um, which was a nun. Let's see here. Uh, the Immaculate Birth of Mary Rosenthal, or Maria Rosenthal. Um, so apparently... There was a nun in Germany way back when, 1700s, 1742 or something like that. And they said that they conceived a child without being, uh, you know, have, without having sexual relations with a man. So she was a nun. She ended up getting pregnant. And obviously the church um, thought it was an immaculate conception. So there was a big to-do about it. And this is going to be the story about that. Um, just so you guys know, this video is in Spanish, but it does have subtitles at the bottom. It was the only video that I could find that had any kind of story or anything that was kind of um, was well put together. It was like a whole bunch of other videos, but it's a bunch of clowns like me. They were just trying to put pieces together. <laughs> so this was the only video that I found that actually got their stuff together. Um, and it's in Spanish, but there are subtitles in the bottom. And I'm going to be reading a bit of a story afterwards um, to put a little bit more context, context into it um, because there's a little more information that I don't think they covered in the video um, that is relevant to the whole story at the very end. So uh, we'll watch the video first and then we'll jump into the story afterwards so you guys can get a little more context. But uh, here we go. Um, the Immaculate Birth of Maria Rosenthal. Más de 150.000 documentos, más de 85 kilómetros lineales de estanterías y más de 800 años de historia son los que conforman el archivo secreto del Vaticano, que se encuentra al lado de la Biblioteca Apostólica y justo al norte de la Capilla Sixtina. Shout out to Ivancito Azteca. If you guys um, are looking for more uh, stories about this kind of stuff, we have some great videos about all kinds of things, occult, but that's his channel in the bottom corner. Is it right here? Right there, right there, right there. Um, so you guys can take a look at that. I have the link to his channel down below as well, so you guys can stop in. Pero por más que llegue a sonar redundante, no es ningún secreto que entre la gran cantidad de archivos que guarda la Iglesia Católica, se encuentre un vasto número de pruebas sobre las atrocidades que... I would love to gain access to the Vatican archives, just even for a day. I know there's like miles and miles of it. Just imagine tucked away in a corner somewhere of the Vatican archives, somewhere in the way back in a box somewhere that nobody's, nobody even remembers is there anymore. Something that's just back there, like some kind of secret throughout history that nobody knows. And maybe nobody will ever know, but it's just kind of sitting back there collecting dust. And uh, it's just, it would just be amazing to kind of read through them, see what kind of information's in there. Um, that's probably one of my biggest dreams. Que le ha hecho el catolicismo a la humanidad con el fin de ocultar tales hechos, como por ejemplo, las aterradoras torturas de la Santa Inquisición. Pero en esta ocasión en específico, vamos a hablar sobre un secreto en particular acerca de una de las más fieles seguidoras de esta religión. Estoy hablando de la Madre María Rosenthal, a quien estás viendo en pantalla, y cuyo caso... 
Yeah. So for everybody that's just watching this right now and they see this head in a box. Um, so they thought that she was like possessed or after they thought it was an immaculate conception and it didn't end up, end up being so um, because it, the, the baby wasn't born as it wasn't a boy that was born, which they were trying to kind of push as the second coming of Jesus. Um, after they find out that it was going to be a girl, um, they tucked away the baby in like another convent. And then the mom, this nun ended up dying, the mom. And then they kind of spun the story and made it seem like she was possessed by the devil. And they chopped off the head and put it in a box with rosary and holy water and all kinds of stuff. So I think that's how that went. And I'm not sure, remember if it was the mom or the daughter that this is the head of. Um, let me just make sure. Okay, so it is Mary's. The first one was Josephine, which was the mom that had Mary, and this is Mary now. So because she was supposed to be a boy, they were hoping she was supposed to be a boy. She ended up being a girl, and they tucked her away as well. And later on, when she became, spoiler, I'm jumping ahead, but later on she became pregnant as well. Uh, and they thought that was another immaculate conception, but when it turned out it wasn't, and a whole bunch of stuff, they spun it and said that she was possessed, so. Fue ocultado por muchos años, hasta que por medios externos se pudo rescatar la información que estoy por presentarte ahora. ¿Te interesa saber el resto del caso? Pues quédate en este video, porque estoy por revelarte la historia real de la monja María Rosenthal. Todo comenzó en el año de 1742, con la madre Josephine Rosenthal, quien se encontraba al servicio religioso en el monasterio Hohenhardt, en Alemania. Un día, dicha monja amaneció enferma, por lo que la madre superiora mandó traer un médico de la localidad más cercana. Es así como inmediatamente se le diagnostica un embarazo, y al mismo tiempo, por más extraño que parezca, el médico descarta toda posibilidad de que la madre Josephine Rosenthal haya tenido contacto alguno con un varón. Su historia se hizo tan popular que más temprano que tarde el caso llegó al consejo de Benedicto XIV, en donde fue examinada nuevamente y se declaró que la hermana Josephine había sufrido inmaculada concepción, ya que desde su nacimiento siempre permaneció en uno u otro monasterio sin tener estrictamente contacto alguno con el sexo opuesto, por lo que la iglesia no podía dejar pasar la oportunidad de hacer pasar este hecho como una señal divina ante los ojos de la sociedad. Es así como esta monja fue movida de su monasterio a una capilla donde sería venerada. Finalmente, cuando tenía ocho meses de embarazo, da luz y muere en el parto debido a una excesiva pérdida de sangre. La sorpresa fue para la iglesia y el resto de los espectadores, ya que la mayoría esperaba un varón, especialmente los grandes líderes religiosos, ya que de esta manera podían anunciar la segunda llegada de Jesucristo a nuestro mundo. Sin embargo, no fue así, porque para su desgracia, el producto de este embarazo resultó ser una niña, la cual fue bautizada con el nombre de María. Es así que esta niña comienza a ser vista como una abominación y a ser repudiada por los sacerdotes de la época, a tal grado de querer sacrificarla, por lo que las monjas acuden en su ayuda y la esconden de la sociedad en un convento durante el resto de su vida. A pesar de todos los problemas, la niña comienza a ser venerada como una santa, recibe visitas a diario y más tarde se convierte en un estandarte femenino, pues ella sería la autora de muchos escritos sobre el maltrato a la mujer en las instituciones eclesiásticas, a fin de ganarse poco a poco el corazón del pueblo y al mismo tiempo intimidando de esta manera a los líderes religiosos con el ascenso de María como una nueva cabeza para la iglesia. Cuando llegó a la edad de 33 años, María cae enferma y muere súbitamente. Dicha muerte fue vista como otra señal divina por ser precisamente la edad a la que murió Jesucristo. Mientras las monjas comienzan a embalsamar el cuerpo sin vida de María, descubren que se encontraba embarazada. Además de eso, se dan cuenta que el feto llevaba bastante tiempo sin vida, lo cual sin duda ocasionó la muerte de María. Pero lo más extraño es que al igual que su madre, 
pasó toda su vida dentro de un convento sin llegar a mantener ningún tipo de relación con un hombre. Al darse cuenta de esto, las monjas deciden comenzar a hacer reliquias con el cuerpo de María, mismas que fueron rechazadas oficialmente por la iglesia, pero no por el convento, ya que aquí fueron veneradas por distintas generaciones hasta que un incendio en 1805 destruye prácticamente todo, salvo su cara embalsamada, un frasco de cristal con sangre, una pequeña caja con un mechón de su pelo y un fragmento de su último escrito religioso en pro de la mujer. Con la caída del convento, estas últimas reliquias se venden para no ser vistas sino hasta el siglo XX, cuando el señor Thomas Merrilin las descubre en una tienda de antigüedades. Décadas después de su muerte, en 1942, sus condescendientes descubren estos restos y deciden utilizar la ciencia para extraer muestras de ADN y autentificar esta leyenda. Finalmente, tras el minucioso análisis de las muestras, se llegó a la conclusión que debido a la cantidad de hormonas masculinas y femeninas de María Rosenthal, así como de su madre, Josephine Rosenthal, ambas eran hermafroditas, por lo que probablemente tuvieron la capacidad de embarazarse a sí mismas, motivo por el cual la iglesia decidió ocultar este caso hasta nuestros días, y es así, de este modo, como finalmente es revelado el misterio de la monja María Rosenthal, quien mientras sigan pasando los años, nos seguirá observando a través de su pequeña caja de madera. Si el video te gustó, dale like y suscríbete. Sígueme en todas mis redes sociales. Subo con... Yeah, so there you go, Ivancito Azteca. If you guys um, want to check out more of his stuff, he has some great videos as well. You can find him on YouTube there. There's his Facebook and his Instagram uh, and Twitter down there below. Can't really see it. You click up and there you go. Um, that's the video there for that guy. Um, yeah, so they did actually did cover that at the very end. So um, we'll try to jump through as well. A lot of the information they already covered in the video, but we can jump to this um, article as well. Just real quick. It's a real short one. Um, we'll pop this in here. So it says, Hohenwart Monastery was a nunnery of the Benedictine Order located in Hohenwart in Bavaria, Germany. Due to its location, monastery was entirely cut off from local villages. So when... One of the nuns became pregnant. It was thought to be a holy event, like he said. A uh, nun was Sister Josephine, which was the mother. 1742, she was pregnant and had a born, uh, was, gave birth to a daughter in the nunnery um, outside of Abbott. After an examination, it was declared that she was still a virgin. Right? That's why I thought she was had an immaculate conception. Uh, baby was born at eight months. Joseph, uh, Josephine was a baby girl. The, no. Maria was the baby girl. Josephine was the mom who died at birth. Um, so obviously the religious leaders of the Vatican wanted to get rid of her uh, after they saw that it was going to be a baby girl and not a boy, which you know they couldn't use to their advantage to push the second coming of Jesus. Uh, they wanted to get rid of her, so they wanted to kill her. But the nuns at the monastery hid her for, you know, for her entire life. Uh, there, so that way they couldn't get a, they couldn't get their hands on her. Um, Sister Josephine Rosenfall's story reached the masses despite all attempts to quell the story. Father Eric finally agreed that the Immaculate Conception should be seen as a good sign. Uh, he had Josephine moved from the nunnery to a chapel where she could be prayed for. After only eight months, Josephine gave birth to a baby girl just before dying from blood loss. The baby, though underweight at birth, made a quick recovery and was christened Maria. Although the nuns were excited and eagerly welcomed the baby, the Council of Benedict was not so pleased. A female born of immaculate conception was attested and scorned. Some had seen Josephine as the vessel of the second coming of Christ, but a girl completely destroyed this idea. Abbot Eric was asked to tell the congregation that the baby had died though the lie saddened him. He ultimately agreed. The nuns disagreed with the decision of the Council of Benedict. They kept the child with them, raising her to be a nun. Though the people had been told of her death, many knew it was false. Maria attracted a loyal following of people and even drew a formidable crowd. Uh, the locals found her inspiring and her mere presence moved to transform other Benedictine communities. Of course, the higher echelons of the church denounced her. They declared worship of her as heresy, even though it was because of her that their churches were prospering, obviously, making a lot of money. 
During her life, Maria Rosenthal went on to write two treaty treatises, treatises, yeah, of which only a fragment remains today. Uh, that treaties dealt with original sin and the condemnation of the female. Though she pleaded with the church for revisions, nothing was ever done. Around the time of her 33rd birthday, Maria became ill. Doctors could not determine what was wrong with her, though her followers believed that her death would signify the second death of the holy progeny. Just as Jesus, just as Christ had died around this age, so so would she. Jesus, I can't read today. She had inspired ideas, of feminism, and reclamation of respect. She had brought strength to the community, yet the church fought her. So she was the original uh, feminist way before Jezebel and all that stuff, uh, feminism. The first wave, of, so she was like the true first wave of feminism. Um, let's see, she had brought strength to the community, yet the church fought her every inch of the way. When she died, the people defied the church and began to idolize and worship her remains. Uh, the front portion of Mary's skull and face were preserved. Jesus, imagine somebody's dead and you just saw the, the front half of their head off and put it in a box. Yikes. All, um, the front portion of Mary's skull and face were preserved and stored in a wooden box. Also in the box was a vial of her blood stored with a glass vessel, within a glass vessel, within a gold leaf case. A lock of her hair and a, the fragment of her second treaties are stored. Since the time of her death, her blood and skin were analyzed in 1905 and found to contain unique genetic traits. Uh, it wasn't until the mid-1950s that these traits were attributed to a rare lineage. As it would turn out, both Maria and her mother, Josephine, were hermaphrodites. Um... So I know kind of what a hermaphrodite is. I think. Let's see. Sorry. I, I mean, I've always known about hermaphrodites. I just didn't know exactly what they were. Hermaphrodite is an organism that has both kinds of reproductive organs and can produce both gametes associated with male and female sexes. Uh, many taxonomic groups of animals, well, like other animals are both as well, but I think they have the ability to get themselves pregnant, which is a lot of what happens uh, to hermaphrodites from what I had read previously. Um, so this obviously was probably more likely what happened. You know, obviously her mom was one as well, so she got herself pregnant. And then she was born and she was exactly like her mom and she got herself pregnant later on. So that's probably most likely what ended up happening. Um, but it's still interesting that, you know, it's, it's crazy just on the face, at face level, like, you know, what that inspired within the church and how it, it caused leadership in the church to act and all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, so since the time of her death, her blood has been attributes to really needed. As it would turn out, both Mary and her mother, Josephine, were hermaphrodites and able to spontaneously impregnate and give birth to children. A condition that would ultimately kill them both. I'm not sure if that causes people to die early or how that works. Um, it was agreed that Mary had been pregnant at the time of her death, though whether this was true, we do not know. Uh, though today the church no longer stands, many things remain, including the box with Maria's skull, vial of blood, lock of hair, and treaties, and her own rosary. Yeah. So that's that. I have this link as well. Uh, it comes from thescarechamber.com. I have that link in the show notes as well below. Um, but it's crazy. I mean, I thought about this a lot. How much of our recorded history is because of maybe medical, I guess, conditions or whatever that they just didn't know about in the way back when, you know? Obviously, doctors and science wasn't as advanced as it is now, so they were just looking at it through the lens of what they had at that time. Whether they thought that was something holy or black magic or something crazy like that 
maybe it was just some kind of medical condition that nobody could explain because they had absolutely no idea what it was. And I wonder how many stories we have today are because of that. Something that they couldn't, they just couldn't explain medically and they just had no words or explanation for it. And then they just kind of chalked it up to, you know, some kind of religious miracle or something from the devil or something, you know, it's definitely interesting. I don't know, but, um, yeah, I guess you guys let me know what you guys think in the sh comments below. Um, I'll have the email address and everything listed with all our social media you guys can find us on. Shoot me a recommendation for another video if you guys have any topics you want to talk about. Uh, we'll be popping them out here within the next week or so. We'll be popping out a whole lot of videos, so you guys uh, stay tuned for that. I uh, appreciate you guys. You guys have a great weekend, and I'll catch you in the next one. Later, guys.